Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valera Leov and welcome to today's lecture on YouTube. So today we're going to be talking about defense. And I know what you guys are thinking. Larry, have you, you've covered that. You've had a webinar just a couple months ago where you covered defense. So why am I covering the same topic again? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, it's because I could only cover so much within the first webinar that we did. So there's obviously a lot more to be covered. And secondly, because I showed mostly the theoretical concepts of defense, and I wasn't able to show so much of the practical application. And I think the practical application is even more important. If you actually think of it, it's like more, the most valuable thing. Be able to apply, you know, the right concepts in general. So I'm going to show you some fantastic examples on how defense is working and what you've got to do. So let's let me clarify what we're going to discuss today. We'll start by a brilliant master example on how to break out a passive position. Now, this is the biggest problem of most players. They lose not because they don't know what to do, but because they get passive and they do not get out they don't find a way to get out of the passive position. So I'm going to tell you how that's done, and I want you to be very careful. So I'm gonna, first, I'm gonna open up the first one. By the way, while I'm actually talking about that, I do wanna recommend you that to, to check out the 50% of brilliant package that, of like that, that ICC, uh, like the, the, you know, and, and many other sites have been offering all the time because it's one of the brilliant, Excellent. I've been an author actually about this chess bundle. It's about defense. It's about all the different techniques. It's only available for like 10 hours from now at this 50% discount. It's a few grandmasters and me included. I've been authors there. So there is a link. I just put it on the chat or you can check it up below the video. So let's begin with the first example for today. Practical application on how defense is supposed to work. So. Let me bring it up. Wait on for one second. I do hope that you can all hear me, by the way. It's, uh, there's no problem with the sound, I think. So, hang on. We're going to start with an amazing game that was played by Bobby Fischer himself. And I think this is the best way to, to go about that. Fischer was playing versus Taimanov. Now, some of you might have heard of it about that. Fischer beat Taimanov with six to nothing. So actually that is that's amazing this this game. But uh, um I want to bring it to you as to what really happened in this one game that they that these guys played. So hang on. Okay. Just a second. So we'll, this is an exercise of a game that happened between yeah, I think it should be copied in a few seconds. There we go. So let's look at it from the black side. Bobby Fischer was playing black, and he didn't have a good opening. The fact is that white is applying pressure with a screen against both e6 and b8. And the trouble is that we have that king that's a little exposed. I mean, truth be told, there's a lot more than what you can see in terms of difficulty. The open file is something we can't control as black. The king is exposed, the bishop feels bad. I mean, everywhere you look, you will likely find out that black isn't doing well. There is a lot of trouble with the position. So what should we do or play right now? How should black advance or move win now? Uh, I gotta say that, <clears throat> It's a bit passive, but passivity is nothing terrible. It means that you're going downhill, but you can stop and get back. How should black play this position? Now, let's do it more interactive. For those of you who've seen that game, don't worry. Just shut up, please. <laughs> and don't put your suggestions on the chat. But for those of you who haven't actually thought of this, uh, you know, I haven't seen this game. Just provide your suggestions and I'll comment on them. Rook d8, not, not working. He'll take it. He has two attackers. So Fisher playing with black had to figure out a different way on how to confront 
and challenge. Rook b7 is going to be good if it wasn't for the white bishop that's controlling that square. Maybe we can try a move like uh, g5. That'd be good. But, you know, when you're defending, one thing you don't want to do is let your opponent to capitalize on his advantage, like win a pawn. Uh, we can try playing <clears throat> bishop f8, possibly. But then black will do, white will do queen c7 to attack a7. Not very good. No, 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 no. You know, that's not going to work. It's it's nice to think about bishop f8. I agree. This is not bad. But then we're only kind of provoking him to attack us here and here. Not good. No, no, no. Uh, no, bishop b3 is interesting. I agree. That's a good counterattacking move, by the way. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. But there is a problem with that move, too. What is it? Well... I mean, if we set the, the the bishop up there in the b3, he's going to attack us first. He'll try bishop c6, I think. And uh, now if we move down to, say, c8, he'll likely take that pawn without even bothering that we can take the, take the rook. If we take the rook right now, you could just see the activity that white is able to impose, or maybe even bishop to the d5. Check. Here. Queen e5. And uh, it's trouble. A lot of it. G7. We win, we lose. And then if we play rook b7, there's a take and checkmate. So it's it's a it's a very strange way, but you know, it really works. It's it's bad. You can't do it this way. It's an interesting line, that's why I want to show it to you, but uh, unfortunately, it kind of fails, no matter what. Takes, takes, still has bishop b5, so we're material down. We're going to let him capitalize. You know, when you're in a bad position, let me tell you one rule. Never, ever let him take a permanent advantage. Now, what if you said, Larry, perhaps we could try to take the c the, the e3. What about that? It's, it's like, like a blunder. Not really, because of the bishop f2, you can't return the queen. It's the BA that's hanging. Thank you for your suggestions. Those, those were all interesting moves, and, and they require good feedback. See, so bishop c8 is too passive. Rook c8 is too passive. We can't do that. I mean, oh, sorry, queen c8 is too passive. We can't do that. Uh, you know, that's why we're losing it. Mm, damn, we, we, it's not great. Bishop b3 is not that great. What if we try bishop f7? I saw so many suggestions by you guys. Bishop, bishop f7 is interesting. Should we do it? Uh, I think we could. But then again, we open possibility of white's queen to advance. So he'll attack us here. And uh, f6 is hanging. So I don't know. I, I really don't feel comfortable about letting him win a pawn. Remember, if you are under pressure, there's still hope that you can defend. But if you, remember, if you give him a chance to capitalize on his advantage, like win material, then it becomes very difficult because it's not just about his attack and not, not, no more. It's about you trying to get the material back, and that's much more difficult than dealing with one or two active pieces. H6, sure, but what's the real deal of that move? It's There's nothing that this move is really going to give us. Why do we play bishop c6? I mean, you see, this. there's this problem always. No, king f7 is even more exposed. So I got a very interesting suggestion. Just like only one out of these, which was, what if we do rook c8? You see, that's an interesting move. Not only because we prevent the bishop c6 from happening, that dangerous move, but because we stabilize. Now, I want to tell you about this part. I mentioned to you briefly um, last time when I had a webinar on defending that stabilizing is that method with which we can keep everything together and make sure that he can penetrate our position. It's a very special move. Prevents queen c7 exactly, and we take away the c6. It's a beautiful move, very good, and uh, he cannot move and do something. This is very, very good. Uh, you know, anything else would have left, it vul left us vulnerable to these squares and these squares. But then suddenly that move protects it all. 
and that's great. If white plays bishop b7, <clears throat> we could actually do, uh, I mean, now it's even, you know, actually I'm thinking about that, bishop f8 could work out. And then after queen d2, rook b8. See, it's, it's very good. Now white played a5. See if anybody could tell me what black should do now. <clears throat> what to do next. I mean, we have a good game, but it's still we're still not out of trouble. It's still a pretty difficult looking position, and he's still challenging us the very same way. Does anybody have a suggestion on how Black can get out of the here? What else can he do to escape? <clears throat> hmm. Anyone? Sack to queen. Sure, that's the fastest way for you to lose. But bishop f8, absolutely. That's the second concept. See, once you've already stabilized the position, like make sure that, that the opponent doesn't actually threaten you or like he cannot damage your game, then you do neutralizing. That's the second principle. It basically suggests that you have to get rid of the opponent's strong or powerful pieces. You know, and that's what we do with the move of bishop f8. Very important. White plays queen d2, <clears throat> and then we apply bishop b7. The two bishops are, have not only just taken away any of the threats, but then we've also neutralized the queen, and we're going to prepare to neutralize this rook. It's a strong operation of stabilizing and neutralizing one after the other. It's great. Well, I mean... How did Fisher win this game? I mean, White is just attacking even more. Did he win it or no? Well, let's see. White played bishop to d5. Now what? Okay, we can trade or not. But uh, what to do? No, we can't do rook d8. He'll take on e6 and give a check. <clears throat> Queen f7, much better move. Thank you. It's perfect. We stabilize and we, we slowly bring our pieces together. So that's the third step. I call it consolidation. Consolidation means you take up your some some of your bad pieces and or pieces you need and you bring them closely to more advanced places. That way you reinforce your position and you strengthen everything. So now when the exchange comes, black's queen is ready. And white plays queen. Oh, not there. He certainly didn't do that. <laughs> Time out of plate, queen d7. Yeah, this is the move. All right, so he moves the queen, <clears throat> and he tries to attack. Oh, why not queen d7? Absolutely. Is queen, queen d7, you mean from black's side? It's actually very simple. If black played queen d7 at this particular moment... White would have likely played e4, and uh, we have this queen sitting on a mo I mean, the, on, the, on the line against White's queen and rook. We also have the pin. So with queen f7, if White tried e4, it would have been very different, as now Black no longer has to worry that this there is a big pin. No longer has to worry about the queen. You can take, and it just feels safer. See, you, you don't want to expose yourself too much. Make it safer, simpler. Don't leave motives like the x-ray of the white rook and queen. So slowly, that's it. Now what? F7 is just safer. That looks more sound. Where to go now? I think it better is queen. Yes, you think right. Queen was much better than F7. And, and of course, after the exchange, everything's good. OK, king F7. Absolutely terrific. That was Fisher's move, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> truth be told, with that move in mind, you can see how Black is able to hold everything together while at the same time he makes a challenge. Don't think that exchanges are going to be uh, is going to get you out of trouble. If Black did this after Rook takes d7, there would have been a significant problem. Exchanges are not the way out, not at least in most times. What we would prefer to do is a move. That keeps everything together. That doesn't let him to capitalize. And so he tried queen takes a7. 
Now, apparently, we don't want to take an E3 due to the same reason as before. So, uh, okay, if we take, for those of you who may be thinking what's going to happen, it's a pretty terrible consequence. So, what should black do now? We don't want to take anything else. Vedic state, absolutely. That's another pattern. You see, once you've stabilized the position, like so there's no damage, you can apply different, you know, strategies. Sometimes you can neutralize the opponent's good pieces, like challenging them away. Some things you may not have that, which is ultimately great, but you may not have that ability. And then you would like to consolidate, get more pieces, get stronger. Finally, you would like to consider the moves that simplify. Simplifying since the position means to exchange more. Exchange more of the opponent's good forces, and thereby, the more you simplify, the more you exchange, the lesser and lesser your opponent's tactics will become. So you played e4. I don't know why you did that, but you did it. So what should black do next? All right, so what to do next? Isn't queen g4 a threat? Good question. Thank you. I think it's a good uh, idea, but you realize that if we do queen g4, why is going to do rig d7? He's going to, you see, attack us. And remember, when you've picked up one strategy, like you want to defend, forget the rest. You want to be just defending, and that's all. Now, not passive defense, but you have to find a way to kick away your opponent from, from being able to do all that pressure and all that damage, and then you can go on for some other stuff. So, there's got to be something else White has to do. G5, it's too risky. I think if we do this, White will just... Oh, sorry. If we take it, White will just capture and... No, that's certainly not good. It's too weakening. We don't want to weaken our position as much, you know? If we're going to do it, we have to do it in our own, at our own terms, in our own way. <clears throat> Take the pawn on e4. Okay, uh, oh, that's not great, to, considering rook e1. Now, one of you asked the question, why didn't white play a rook to d7 before? Would not have just strengthened his position? He would have, but if you think about it carefully, you realize that it's not going to do much. See? In fact, after rook d7, I'd say black would just take e3. And that's a pretty scary counterattack. e3 and, uh, you know, wherever the king goes, maybe black can even do rook c6 and rook e6. That's, that's going to be bad. No, no, no. Well, I picked up the right way to play e4. He just he didn't want to attack so much as, as he actually wanted to make sure he's keeping a good, strong position. Breaking the pin? Not a bad idea. We could break the pin. But, um, you know, there's a problem here. If we do it, it's going to be just a temporary solution. Why well, can make rook d7 or maybe even some other moves in time or h3, queen b7. It's, it's not the best. See, the best way to defend ever is to neutralize. This black does it for a second time. As he moves his queen, sorry, and progresses to the point after e4, queen to the c6, and progresses to think about rook a8. If that queen is kicked out, then there will be nothing more. And you can see it for yourself. Rook d7, queen takes e4 to defend. Now we have the protection of e7. And we're doing great. It's beautiful how Fisher, out of a completely losing position, now he turns it into something that, despite all of White's great pieces, he's suffering. This is not cool. Now, remember that. The threats or the attack are only as good as, you know, the pressure can stay. If at a certain point the threats are not available, or the pressure is gone, then that means that the attack is just, or whatever is left of the attack, like the good pieces are just the, uh, uh, you know, 
good outfit for white. Nothing else. It's it's a good piece, good queen, good rook, nothing more. So white played h3, so the danger, and he tried to run. But, um, yeah, black stabilized, a4 again. You see, bishop f2, and king f5. It wasn't dangerous, but just a little, let's make a little bit of prophylaxis. Why should we stay on the pin? c4. And White's trying to keep the pressure. Remember, like, everything is about pressure. He wants to, like, lead the game through. Now, one of you has said, how would White have won? He didn't have a chance to win. He had a good position, but with the time, he's losing that advantage. Um, White couldn't have won, of course. <laughs> if he could have, he would have found it. Uh, he had a good position, but the problem is he made some dubious moves. We're going to come back to that later and talk about what... What gave Black those opportunities? But anyway, going here, what do you think Black should do now? It's not over yet. The pressure is still on. The challenges are still there. We got a trouble. We got an issue to work to work out. Question is, how do we work it out, and what to do now? <clears throat> Rook a8, maybe. Rook a8. Um, true. You know, I'm. I bet that rook a8 does not look like a bad move. I mean, White will play queen c7. He'll be attacking on c5, and it's not bad. We could try to move the pawn, but right now there's too much at stake, and we'll lose. This is not good. Uh -uh. I'm sure. Fisher had something else in mind. And White wins, of course. He would win if we play like that. Now, I got a very interesting suggestion. The only one suggestion that... Uh, no, after rook e8, White cannot take e7. No, no, you're wrong. He can't take. We got queen b1, and that's bad for White. But he'll play because of queen c7. Keep the pressure. That doesn't work. Okay, so... Bans the A-pawn. Absolutely. That looks crazy. I mean, we're just giving away a pawn. But then you realize that this is made just with the same idea why we did queen c6, rook c8, and all. To fight the attacking pieces. Why is an attack available? It's because of the threats. And why are the threats there? Because of the pieces. This means if you deal with the pieces, then you deal with the threats. And if you deal with the threats... You deal with the attack. After rook e8 and queen b2, as it came on, black played now the move of king e8. It was a crazy looking move, but it's brilliant. How white's now queen and rook, despite their active positions, cannot coordinate and really create any menace to black. Uh, you're probably thinking, Valeri, what if white comes out to capture d at c5? And while you're thinking about that, let me remind you that Black isn't just going to stay in defend all the time. He's got his stuff going. So now I realize that he might be in danger. He started returning, retreating. The moment it just starts retreating, things are going downhill. Black took the pawn. Takes. 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 King g7. And then after rook to f1, queen e4. Now, Black isn't winning, but he's certainly not losing. And that was very important. Check. King h6. And I guess either because uh, Taimanov was tired or maybe because he was too, too frustrated, he made the blunder of capturing f6, which allowed Black to make a check and win the game. It was apparently a big blunder here. But what I want to show you is, going back from the very beginning, do not forget that one of the most important rules of successful defense like stands with the ability to stabilize, like prevent any damage from happening, then neutralize by kicking the opponent's good pieces, then we stabilize again, and then we stabilize again. You know, then we stabilize again, prevent, prevent preventing anything, and then we simplify by exchanging the pawn. You see how each of those elements is like they're, they're interacting each other with each other. Then we neutralize with the queen to c6 move, 
And of course, we stabilize again. Now we 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 we, we consolidate. That was a consolidating move, move that just you know keeps everything together while we improve something. And then we just make a prophylactic move. So many stabilizing means stay out of danger. Don't let him win material. Neutralizing means fight his good pieces. If you do that, you prevent the damage. Then we have consolidating means like strengthen your position and defense in general. Simplifying means exchange the pawns. There are lots of lots of these small things that a good master of defense know how knows how to apply them so that his position stays solid at all times, even if, if it feels under pressure. And the more important thing was, uh, you know, when it came out, it was the counterattack. Very powerful possibility. I do recommend you to check the defense, the, the, the defense training bundle, which is fantastic. It has more than six DVD courses explaining each of these principles that I was telling you about. It's at a fantastic 50% discount on the link that I just posted in the chat, and you can also find it uh, beneath the video. So check it out. It's a great six training courses on how to defend and how to think about these positions so check it out it's great and uh, the end game was probably a draw of course i would say so but you know sometimes here uh queen b2 and king e8 like just people people make a blunder you know they, they definitely do that okay well in any way i am glad that uh, we got to talk about this it was an instructive example good principles and uh, good ideas so all is good all right let's take a look at another example now just wanted to show it to tell you if you guys want me to send you all these annotated examples so you can add some notes and just keep them for for archive you can you can email me at valeri.lilov at gmail.com. I'm going to put my email on the chat. So do send me an email, or you can just directly message me uh, through, your, through my website if that's going to be easier, tagalilov.com. I would love to uh, like send you the files with the annotations and everything. So, um, yeah, let's move on to the next game. Now, what else would I like to show you now? Since apparently this was a pretty instructive example, what else? We've seen, we've seen the elements, but, you know, how to use tactics as defense for attacking, you know? Sometimes you can do that, and people don't understand the risks. They don't understand when and how that can be done. So, here's me, ready to show you how to use tactics as part of your defense. So... Bear with me for a second. I'm going to bring one of the most instructive examples up here. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Tactics as a part of the defense is a super difficult thing to do, but we're going to start with a, a really smart example played by Capablanca. So I'm going to bring it over. This was a game that was played by Capablanca himself versus someone named Corzo. Corzo in, in, in Princi, Principi or whatever. I don't know how to pronounce that name. It was a good game because Capablanca being one of the best positional players, one of the best endgame players, had to resolve a problem. And I don't know what to tell you, but this was a really difficult problem. You may not see it right now, but then there's the pin that White has made against the e4 knight. He's planning to bring his own bishop to challenge us, and uh, it's sort of a difficulty, a big difficulty. So what to do now? Okay, so let's see. Please repeat once the steps. I don't need to repeat them because you've got the recording of this, so you can watch it at any time. Just remember which minute it is, and then you can watch it. Now, we, what have you said? Car Carlson and Kuryagin are excellent defenders. Will we see a lot of these concepts in their match? I suppose. Yeah, I'm going to be annotating some of the most instructive games once they start, so don't worry. I'll bring some of those up once they play them. Okay, so... Um, Kriakin is apparently a very good calculator, you said, which means an excellent in defense. But yes, probably. <laughs> I don't know who's going to get crushed, really. I have no idea. But I'm definitely certain that there will be a lot of very good games, very instructive games. 
Don't you think that counterplay is the best defense? No. Counterplay is only possible after you have consolidated your position. Okay? If you haven't done that and you try counterplay while you're weak, it's like imagine in, 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 a, in a match where the, you know, your opponent has hurt you, in a battle where he's hurt you, instead of just trying to take it easy, you try to go after him. That's never going to work. He has an advantage. He has an edge. So you have to take this slow, make the, follow the right steps so you can heal your position, and then you can try to counterattack or make it, you know, count some, some active counterplay. Anyway, back to the position. Blocks to move. He's got to find a way to deal with the trouble. Rook e8, you said. Well, it's, that's interesting for sure. Do we play this? I mean, if we do rook e8, <clears throat> I don't know. Because to me, white can play knight g5 here. And uh, we got a trouble. Now, it's not just the fact that we got to worry about the knight takes e4. There's a lot more than that. Queen d7, knight takes h7, checkmate is, is, is actually prepared. So that's part. That's horrible. I don't know. I really don't think this is going to be great for us. Nope. Anyone else? Does defense always go in order to stabilize, neutralize, simplify? Concern? No. These are elements that will help you to find out exactly what you're looking for. And if you master those elements, it will make defending much less difficult and uh, simpler for you to manage it. I find defending very hard and tips to be a better defender are helpful. I'm more good at attacking. Everybody is good at attacking, but uh, yeah, defending is necessary. You just, you don't choose want to do it. Can we just play to move queen d7 now? Just I got this suggestion. Okay, we could. But then why do we play g4? And that's the problem. You know, that, that now if we take with the bishop, you win our knight. h6 more or less fails due to the same reasoning. If we play h6, I think white will just play an exchange. And when we take back, there's bishop d3. Both of his pieces are going to be piled up against our knight. And then we have the g4 to worry about. So that's that's not good, I'd say. Nope. Anyone else? Queen to d7. I find that interesting, but we talked about it. It doesn't work. Sometimes just, I think I'm attacking, but I'm really not. Yeah, well, it depends. Anyway. Keep looking, and, and now remember the theme of this position. We need to find how to use, you know, tactical approach to defending a very difficult position. Now, what are the kings doing on g1 and f8? That's a very good question. I mean, black obviously retreated, and white decided to make an artificial castling uh, with his king. But that's a good point, because those kings look very uh, unsafe. Now, can we try c5 or bishop takes d4? I guess c5 is fine. He'll exchange, though, and same thing. He wants to trade, play bishop d3, and go for g4. We're really messed up in that position. Can we do uh, darker bishop take white dark? Um, dot, dot's not going to work. How is the darker bishop take the white bishop? <laughs> oh, you mean like white's bishop on d4? Yeah, but then white will just it will just help him by bringing his queen. Now, call me Smurf just recommended two times a pretty interesting idea. Good job, Smurf. There's g5. And yeah, I can call you Smurf, but definitely it was it was a really, really good move. Thank you. That's good. G5. Now that is super cool move. Of course, it's not everything, but this exactly in introduces the co the tactical approach. If you're ever thinking of a defense that requires a more aggressive, more attacking, more tactical approach, you surely you sure need to think about where is we is you weak. There is no position that's all strong everywhere. Now White's weakness is his king. And with g5, black gets an opportunity to exploit it. You can think about any kinds of moves. Even the craziest kinds of moves are there. Now, let's see. Why does this move work? What's the point? Can't white just take again? 
Well, he could. But then we've got a capture in d4. Takes. And knight takes g5. While the rook on e1 is being attacked, we have, we're have creating the checkmating threat on h3. And then you actually lose the game, if you think of it. So he can't do that, I think. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's actually quite beautiful. Now, one of you asks, uh, okay, what, what, if, what would have happened in case Black tried bishop g4? What, what's the issue? Well, it's a big issue. If we tried bishop g4, white would have just taken. Take, queen c2. And then you realize, uh, however, we try to defend that knight as knight g5. You see, we're not using any aggressive approach. We're not attacking him. We're, we're basically defending, even in case you take with the king, it's going to be the same thing. In d4 check this time. And then he's, we're in trouble. So that's not good. See? Just keep that in mind. Uh, in fact, very, very important thing. You know, g5 is the best attacking opportunity to follow up against the opponent. This is all we need. Beautiful. Effective. Now, after g5... Okay, let's see. Can't I just continue his attack with bishop d3? He could. But if he does, now black is just going to play g to xf. And now there's no more knight g5. And because the knight is actually tied down to the defense of the bishop, there's no more knight moves. Take, for example, take, take. Now knight d2. will be met by rook takes g2. Of course, white has to take back. But then there's queen g5. It's going to be a disaster. And then you realize wherever the white king goes, he's likely going to get checkmated, like here in a checkmate, or here, check, and a checkmate. So it's really awful. It's amazing. Look at this. Sometimes the passive approach, like stabilizing or consolidating, is not going to help. So then you got to think about. What are my attacking opportunities? Like, what are the main problems I'm experiencing? Like, in, in, you know, in his, especially his weaknesses. The fact is, the black spears were terrible. And white's major kink was a big weakness. So g5. Now, there's a lot more. Of course, you can play f takes g. But then there's knight takes g. Uh, apparently, if white takes in g5, we take d4. And then his rook is hanging. So we're going to win it. But... Uh, it's if he takes our queen, we get a check and a checkmate. So this is a double discovered check that goes for a checkmate. That doesn't work. <laughs> it's kind of it's, it's not a study. It was a real game that happened. This happened. Capablanca found the g5, and it was incredible. Like after that, White played bishop takes g7, <clears throat> rook takes g7. Now, seeing the consequences of f takes g and everything else, white chose to not do it. So he played this, should d7, and f5. But then, this is the moment where black plays alongside with queen e5. And you could see how strong and deliberately powerful the black pieces become. When they're more active, they're perfect. Now, one of you said, that is so much to calculate. Yes, of course. But, you know, you have to do it. You can't just say, I mean, if you just say, I don't want to calculate, you'll likely lose because this is a difficult position already. You know, we have to calculate. Good thing is you don't have to calculate that long. You have to calculate a few different responses, major responses by the opponent, and then how do you, resp how do you reply to them. The difficult part is seeing the G5. And... Finding out such a move, let me let me clarify that again, is a product of finding of discovering two things. What do you really need out of this position? Like, what are your active opportunities to get? And secondly, what are his weaknesses? Think of that. The weakness is the white king. The need is for black to bring his pieces up in the play. They were too backward for too long. So finding out the need and the weakness can give you a good active approach to carry on your your counterplay g5 bishop takes g7 takes knight d4 there queen e5 happened and rook e8 so why try knight e6 now can try to continue and maybe pose some more trouble 
takes takes so what now it doesn't seem like we're out of trouble right now so what do we do next how to continue now this is a very good question hmm. was the game in Fisher mode no it was just Kappa Blank and playing with Black. Rook takes e6. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> totally on point. Rook takes d6. Just kills down the pawn. And now when white plays d takes d, there's bishop c6. Now you're going to say, okay, hang, hang on, Valeri. This is a little hard to understand. Now, why would we just give away a rook? First of all, the rest of the moves wouldn't have worked. If white takes an e4 and he keeps those pawns, we're dead. It may not be material up too much, but the, the e pawn and the fact that he'll push us back is just horrible. But why do we live? Why are we letting him to win our rook? Because the white rook is completely useless. Now remember this: when you're defending. You're often going to get in a position where you have to evaluate the material by the qualities. Like, how much value does that rook have on h1? Truth be told, it's such a terrible rook that it has basically no quality or no value at all. So in that regard, it is completely irrelevant. One of the things that is so necessary is for you to think about the relative value of each piece based on its strength, you know, like where it can go and what it can do. Why not too much to worry about? And take a look. After the exchange in bishop c6, white played queen f3 check, and black was comfortable enough to even offer an exchange. That was great. Queen e3. King e7. Now you're probably wondering, Valeri, this is crazy. What if white just exchanges? I mean, he's winning, right? No. Tell me how he's going to get that rook out of there. h4, f3. <laughs> the relative value of a piece is its ability to do something, to play a good role and be important. Trouble is, there is no good value of that rook. Rook e3 will prevent f2. But then black can even do king e7. And now if the rook takes f3, at the very least, the material will be won back by attacking the rooks. It's amazing how fantastic each of the black pieces is as they work together. You know, they're just well connected and, and piling up. It's amazing. Good stuff. I mean, really, just uh, out of defending, we got to that position. Now, when do you have to sacrifice? Do it only when you're certain. When you're certain that you get enough. And uh, remember, sacrificing gives your opponent a permanent advantage. So if you do it cautiously, or just you just you do it like so that you can get out of the trouble, you may be losing the game. In this specific case, there wasn't something like that because Black is sacrificed for a very good purpose. He sacrificed it in a way so that after that, uh, you know, like he can deal with the trouble. Now Black even played Knight D two. And uh, now it's not white attacking anymore. It's black attacking. Knight d2 is amazing. We have the threat of knight f3. And there's so much more. White played queen c3. Check. Apparently white messed up here. <laughs> For sure. Here, um, queen f8. Just uh, move, on, move back. Try to take here and take here and do all this stuff. c5. Um... And knight comes back uh, here. Should let me see. Yeah, there. Repetition. King's come. King comes back there. And then Black just took it. Uh, I was impressed the first time when I saw that. Like there are so many different takes, and Black captures c5. Why the hell would he do that? Why wouldn't you just take e1? And then I realized stabilizing is more important. If black went on to capture the e1, the complications arising after the capture may have given him the advantage of a rook up. 
But the problem is that if we haven't stabilized the position, there will always be some complications coming. Maybe not, not so significant, maybe not here, but Black just didn't want to risk it. So he just played BDX to the C here and knight e5. King comes back. That's what happened in the game. In a queen game, fourth f3. So now uh, black is winning. Capture here. Attack the queen. Attack the rook. King is in trouble. And that would happen. Like, really, that's check there. Um, and queen takes h2. Game over. White resign. I mean, the rest of the game wasn't really so interesting. It was the beginning, which shows, you know, how to think about getting out tactically. If you have to defend and you're thinking about a tactical getaway, don't forget that one of the best ways to do it, I mean, really, one of the best ways to do it is if you are looking, more importantly, if you try to be thinking about, you know, how do I open? How do I create the threats? What are the weaknesses? What do I need in the given position? When you think about it that way, it's just beautiful. And I don't know what to tell you, but it was great, greatly played by Black, I think, in this game. So that was uh, that was definitely good. Uh, Knight d2 and some, mo some of these moves. Um, all right. Uh, of course, let's see. There are some questions. Like, let's see the question. Why didn't Black play Bishop takes d6? Because after rook takes d4, he wouldn't have had that powerful bishop. See, Black wanted to maintain that knight. So, uh, you know, it's just a bad idea. Couldn't he just do that? He could have, but he would have lost. All the, all the attack would be gone, and White would have won the bishop. So you see, it's, it's not good. All right, well, that rook is Brad Pitt as background extra in Star Wars. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that rook on H1 was a very good wooden rook, really. It's like a big pawn with a hat, one of my one of my students used to call them. Great game, I agree. I totally agree. Now, again, just keep in mind, if, if anyone of you wants me to send you those games or so, uh, just send me an email to uh you know to my email like i'm just gonna put it in the chat and then uh, or maybe just direct it from my side i'd love to send you those and i know that it's very useful for bringing some notes so check them out also don't forget to check the uh the the, the, the link right beneath the video uh, the link right beneath the video is providing you 50 percent discount of the six fantastic courses in middle game and defense by some uh experienced grandmasters including you know myself as, as an international master so check it out it's a brilliant training package and uh uh yeah you can you can check it you can check out the bundle now uh, what, what else would I like to talk about? Well, I'd like to talk about one more thing, actually. So, now, we've seen how the tactics work as a part of the, the defense. We've seen the, uh, the you know, the opening of the lines, counterattack, and the concepts of, you know, defending. So, there is a question that I've often been asked. Okay, how do you hold off the opponent's initiative? Like, sometimes my opponent just starts attacking me again and again and again and again and again and again and again, and I just don't, don't see a way. I, like, I can't, I can't fight that. I don't know what to do. So, you know, apparently, that's a trouble. How do we deal with something like that? <clears throat> when you think about dealing with your opponent's pressure or a challenge or so, You've got to do two things. First of all, remember to post problem against him, like create threats. And the second very valuable idea is look for an active approach. Like this next example, an extra set of the game is beautiful. It's from my course in defending. I think you're going to love it. So I'm going to show it to you. Here we go. Black to move, and that was played between the Masters Chumak and Chair Mission in, uh, in the Soviet Union, 1976. So Black was in trouble. He saw himself in trouble while he was coming down with all of his pieces, and the Black King was just in the middle of nowhere in the midst of all that fire. So 
I'd like to ask you, what do you think Black should do, guys? And how should Black try to defend? Now, one of you asked, how to do such a defense in rapid game? Means how to fast calculate. These are two different questions. Leading a defense when you're short in time usually requires, you know, that you do the stability, like that you stabilize, and more importantly, try to just reinforce your defense. You don't have to calculate. Fast calculation depends on your trading, but usually it's hard. So that's why I keep a simpler approach and stabilize your position. Finding moves faster, I think I answered that question. So do you have a favorite game of yours where you applied these concepts? I have many, but um, yeah, I haven't prepared them right now. Probably another time. All right. So King H7 is a suggestion. Interesting. I like that. But then, is this really going to work? I mean, if we play king to the h7 as, as a move, what if white jumps up? Like, in, you know, in he plays, he attacks us on the king side. Like, king h7, he can do knight g4, he can threaten on the, in the h6, and uh, more of this damage is likely going to happen. Moves like bishop takes h, queen takes h6. It's just, you know, replacing the one problem with another. That's not going to work. No. Not really. We do rookie aid. That's a very passive move. I don't like that. It's it's trouble. Can we do F5 maybe? It's an interesting suggestion. Let's check it out. F5, but then why do we just play knight D4? I mean, again, it, it is a difficult defense. Takes. And then if we capture back, there's bishop takes f5. It's a, it's a very synchronized attack by most of white's pieces, and, and it's trouble. We can't do that either. Hmm. Can we try rook c5, he said? Well, how does that really help? We can't take e5 after knight g4. So, what if instead of all these moves, we actually do c takes b3? Now, this is a very interesting move, which people would consider crazy. Valeri, I can't to sacrifice my rook. Now, apparently, there are some counterplay chances with Bedex Day. But is it worth sacrificing the rook? I mean, if you really think about the position from the, white, from, from the back perspective, probably no. But yet, it looks quite strong as a delivery. In the game, Black did it. And... Uh, White played the move of knight d2. So black played knight c5, which was incredibly strong. And due to the threat of b3, that looks obviously pretty powerful, white felt that things are going down, so he sacrificed in order to block that pawn. Unfortunately, black didn't care, and he left his queen to hang. So he played this move. <laughs> if white takes the queen... Then black is going to play rook takes d8. And the counterattack is incredible due to the b3 move. In fact, there's no way how white can stop those pawns from moving. This is really fast now. I know. If you're going to say, Valeri, you stop for a second. I, I need to assimilate this. So you're sacrificing a rook. Okay. And then we're actually sacrificing a queen. Okay. And then we're getting three pawns to promote. Now, this is unrealistic. Well, something like that happened in the game, and it was pretty realistic. I mean, truth be told, after knight c5, white captured. And black was so cool, so that when white tried to move his bishop to come back and defend, black just did queen d4. It was awesome. It was really great. I mean, he played b3 first, and he did queen d4. You know? There's the A1 coming, unstoppable, and why I lost it. So, this is crazy. And it really doesn't work. Because you have to understand, when you look at a way to counterattack, you are making this for two reasons. First, it's a distraction. You're making your opponent to stop thinking of what he's doing and start looking at what you're doing. And two... Trying to make sure you're active. Now, if you want to be objective, you have to know how this can be countered. If white 
was thinking about the best way to like to deal with this, he shouldn't have gone back and really do what he did with Knight D2, like just completely freeze because of Black's pawns. But he had to continue and carry on. Remember, the counterattack is a good thing. But as if answered a question of, of, of yours earlier, it just can't happen in any position. You can't jump in and attack out of a bad position and hope it will be successful. If something like that happens, there's a 98% chance that it doesn't succeed. But people get scared. And truth be told, White got scared. If he did simply knight g4, Black's counterattack, it would have never worked. Simply because White's own attacking pieces would have reached much faster than, uh, I think, Black's pawns. The white three to four pieces are now going to be destructive. And uh, you could see moves like rook takes h6, which just kill black. So, hey, can we just take that rook? Sure we can. But then white would still do that. Takes, check, here, check, here. And then uh, what we realize is that there is bishop takes d6. And after rook f7... There will be a take. So we never even get to advance those pawns. <laughs> we never even get to advance those pawns. Damn. That was such a cool pawn maneuver. With those pawns on the queen side. Pawn power! That fails, ultimately. So, damn, this is so good. I mean, if I left it like that, probably nobody would have not as knight g4, right? I mean, I want to do it in my own game like that. I know. But you have to understand that, objectively, counterattacking is the last think you want to do both figuratively and physically you cannot do this unless you're stable or unless you have nothing else to do in that particular case c to the b fails however remember that sometimes these moves like quick counterplay could actually rely on distraction making your opponent just get surprised by what you do because you you likely not expect it and making your pieces very active so in some positions like the previous, it works because we had everything there, all the right circumstance. In a lot of the others, it will be just a possibility for counterplay. And if he makes a mistake or messes it up, it, it, would, it, it, it works. Not in this case, though. So instead of C D, what should Black have played then if that's not right? Well, Ramadi Elements, right? This is the real power. The elements sound complicated, scientific, too challenging. We would much more prefer to have this magical c b 3 move that wins. But truth be told, you want to follow the elements because the elements will show you what you need. And what we need right now is to neutralize. Knight f6 was again a simple, much less beautiful, and yet more effective way on how black could have dealt with the with the, with the white pressure. And in reality, because white's attack is going to be gone in a move or two, you can understand that um, as white gets to move his... Uh, now, now there is a cedix to the b3 threat. As white gets to move his pawn, in fact, I'd say black doesn't have to worry. He may be a piece down, but considering how terrible white's pieces are on the king's side, I certainly would not consider this a bad position. It's actually quite good for black. Knight takes f, maybe happening next move, and a check from the c1. You can see a lot of what black can do when his pieces get open. That would have been a much more effective way. Much less pretty, but better. So you have to understand that the fake counter chances can only be noticed if someone looks at not so much how to defend, but rather how he can attack more powerfully. So if you are from the attacking side, don't get provoked by the opponent to only defend. I mean, you can probably do that in one, one or two moves when needed, but then the moment black slows down without an immediate threat, knight g4 would have been great. So be careful. These shiny-looking moves don't always work, especially when you're from a weak position. On the contrary, if you follow the right elements, which was stabilizing, neutralizing, consolidating, it will show you... Simpler move like Knight of Six, which deals with the attack.
back and helps us to grow our to grow our counterplay in a much more feasible manner. Whew, that was a complicated position, I know. So if you thought, okay, Valeri, this is a little too much, too much going over my head. Yeah, because we're running out of time right now, and I have to had to show the whole position. But uh, this one just shows, I think, the importance of knowing when to sacrifice, how to identify a fake counter chance. And more importantly, don't forget the ultimate rule. The ultimate rule of a successful defense is think of how the opponent will attack. The strong attacking moves will determine whether your defense or contemplate is going to be sufficient or good enough. That's how you can even find out a move like C digs to B is wrong, looking at White's attack on the king's side. So in any case, uh, thank you all for watching. I'm going to be having my next webinar the coming Saturday at the usual time. So um, please tune in. By the way, usual time means 12 o'clock. We had daylight savings in Europe a week or a week ago. So basically, that's why it was like an hour ahead, 1 p.m. It's going to be like 12 o'clock, 12 p.m. Eastern time next Saturday. So so to join in. Will be a really good, uh, a really really good uh, uh, topic I've selected. And once again, don't forget to check the perfect 50% off package on uh, like the mastering and middle game six courses on defense, attacking, and many others. So check it out. And for those of you who want me to send you those examples, don't forget to message me directly to my email, which is valeri.lilov at gmail.com or my website. I'm going to put them on the chat together with the um, together with the link to the 50% discount. Don't forget to check them out and write to me with any suggestions or comments or whatever you may be having. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. And again, if you have any suggestions, questions, ask for games, whatever, feel free to send out. Thank you so much, and I wish you a great weekend.